geoengineering. For some, like me, the technophiles, is an exciting word. It inspires power and responsibility and even exhilaration to what humanity can achieve. For others, uh, it is a sign of hubris, of irresponsible action that does not take into account the unforeseeable consequences of what we do. So is geoengineering something that we should attempt to do or is it something that we should refrain from even though the consequences of inaction can be also dangerous? Well, as it turns out, we are already doing geoengineering. We have been doing geoengineering for 10,000 years, maybe more. We are living in a new geological era. The name of this geological era is the Anthropocene, characterized by the presence of humanity on the planet. The International Geological Union actually um, has been debating whether to adopt this name and whether uh, and, and, and how to decide uh, what is the year that uh, uh, the Anthropocene should officially start. A little bit different from other geological era like uh, the Jurassic or the Cretaceous or, or others that uh, uh, are, are characterized by millions or tens of millions of years um, here or there, the Anthropocene's official start is 1963, uh, which is uh, the year uh, of uh, the ban of atmospheric nuclear explosions. And the reason is because the radioactive dust that uh, these nuclear explosions created deposited uh, over practically all of the surface of the planet is going to be identifiable millions of years from now. So any geologist, human or alien or robotic or AI, uh, in a million years uh, will be able to pinpoint uh, the year and say, okay, really something was going on at that time. These radioactive elements don't exist uh, in the concentrations uh, at those specific isotopes other than as we create them. So it is especially poignant an identifier for this geological era. But of course, even if on the scale of millions or tens of millions of years, it is appropriate to set that year because it is so easily identifiable um, millions of years from now as well, the things that humanity has been doing on the planet left traces that are visible everywhere for thousands of years. If you think about forests, you think about pristine nature, you think about beautiful balance of plants and animals, a rich ecosystem that uh, uh, is respectful of each other and is flourishing untouched by human presence. And you will probably not realize that everywhere you are and everywhere you go, much likely you have never been in a primary forest. If you've never left Europe, if you've never left uh, North America except the farthest uh, reaches of um, of Canada towards the Arctic. Even if you have never 
um, left uh, Russia except uh, the farthest uh, parts of uh, Siberia. If you've never left India or China, in none of these places, any of the forests are primary forests. They are all regrowth that happened after civilizations in centuries and in millennia changed the environment, changed the landscape because of agricultural activities, because of military activities, which is what happened, for example, uh, in, um, uh, in, in Scotia, uh, where um, oak forests have been eliminated to build um, big ships for fighting the Spaniards and for the geographical explorations. Nowhere primary forests are um, the ones that you can see and you can experience. There is some in Africa, but even there, not a lot. And uh, there is some in South America, uh, the Amazon. But even in the Amazon, um, large parts are not primary anymore. They are regrowth uh, of um, those parts that have been changed by, by us, by humanity. So as we look at nature, what we think about nature on this planet, a lot of it has already been changed by us over the course of centuries and, and millennia. What is different today uh, respect, uh, with respect to the past is that we are now aware uh, much more of what we are doing on a global scale and that this global awareness brings with it a keener and more alert understanding of the consequences in terms of human flourishing or human suffering. It was the case in the past that entire empires could collapse with millions of people dying and on another part of the world, nobody would know. Today, we know and we cannot be blind to this knowledge. We cannot be blind to human suffering. We cannot be blind of the lack of opportunities for human flourishing. So if you think about geoengineering, you don't need to pretend that it is something new. You can realize that it is something we have already been doing we just have to do it better. We have to do it with our modern tools of data collection, data analysis, modeling extremely complex systems as well as we can and in an ever improving fashion, and then making decisions based on those models and the data, experiment, feed the results of the experiments in our models, improve our ability to forecast what is going to happen if we intervene one way or another. And we need the types of organizations that are able to, on one hand, design, implement, understand, finance, these operations that are, if experiments local, but by definition, if they need to better manage what is our global civilization, they must become global sooner rather than later. We need new organizations that may not be born from our existing reference frameworks 
of nation states, of groupings of nation states, or of uh, centralized and hierarchical supranational organizations like the United Nations, uh, the European Union, or, or, or others. When you think about climate change, the way that it is framed today is look at the climate is changing and humanity is causing those changes, uh, we have to do something about it. And that kind of framing creates this polarized situation where a lot of people are saying, yes, this is definitely the case, we have to act, we have to act decidedly and, and we have to go back uh, to how things were before. And there are others who are saying, no, actually, uh, those hypotheses are, are not correct. We uh, are not changing the climate. We don't have to intervene. Actually, the more we intervene, uh, the worse uh, we are going to make the situation. Well, we have been intervening and we have been changing the climate as well as the climate has been changing all over uh, by itself. And so the question is not uh, whether we should be doing something because we are already doing it. The question is, should we doing it better or should we doing it worse? Should we doing it with our eyes open or should we be blind and deaf to what we are doing? Should we use the best tools that we have available or we should dumb down our information, ability to act and the level of, of knowledge and empowerment of our civilization? And you can look at it in a very pragmatic manner. Uh, if uh, a thousand years ago, uh, a coastal population of uh, uh, indigenous people was hit by a hurricane, they could do practically nothing about it. They couldn't realize that a hurricane was coming. They couldn't build their shelters and their dwellings in a manner that would resist to the hurricane and they would be completely exposed. They would either survive or perish, but uh, they could do nothing. Today, uh, if we learn about an incoming hurricane, we prepare. And then the question is, if we can do things that make hurricanes more dangerous, should we do those things? Or if we could can do things that make hurricanes less dangerous, should we do those other things? Now, there are a lot of ideas around how to manage uh, the, the climate and how to keep Earth in a friendly system uh, of parameters that make it neither a ball of ice, which happened in the past millions of years ago, nor a scorching desert, because it would be very hard for us to adapt to either of those conditions. Today, the planet is incredibly um, welcoming it is incredibly uh, appropriate to what we want our ideal planet to be. And that is unsurprising because we are adapted to be living on this planet. The air is breathable, uh, the water is uh, drinkable. Most of it is actually not because it is uh, salt water, but uh, Rivers and lakes and rain uh, bring uh, drinkable water. Uh, the soil is uh, fertile and uh, doesn't contain toxic uh, trace elements uh, that would poison us. Uh, 
the solar radiations are um, beautifully uh, shielded uh, so that uh, the dangerous uh, rays are kept uh, away and the ones that uh, reach us uh, not only uh, illuminate uh, our cities and uh, uh, keep us uh, happy but actually help our metabolism to develop the kind of vitamins that we need in order to uh, keep um, uh, and, and, and be healthy. Now, there is no reason for this planet to be like this, except to one, that, as I said, this is what we are adapted to. And two, that we have been lucky. We have been lucky that the fluctuations of at least the climate, uh, but also the stability of the sun and, and other components didn't cause um, extreme variations that could wipe out at least humanity, but maybe also uh, life on, on the planet. And we know something like that will happen. In a few billion years, uh, the sun will become a red giant and the transformation will be such that uh, Earth will completely lose its atmosphere, the oceans will boil, uh, and uh, it will be uh, absolutely uninhabitable. So we know that um, there is a limit. Uh, before that time limit, we have to, uh, if we want to survive as a, as a species and uh, as a civilization, we have to find completely novel solutions. Uh, probably uh, become interplanetary uh, or maybe even interstellar. And billions of years is plenty of time. But we have more urgent changes that we have to face. The increase in the concentrations of CO2, carbon dioxide, in the atmosphere is a change that we have to keep track of. And if we can slow it or reverse it, we should. But if we can't, we have to understand what other measures we can put in place in order to make sure that the seven, eight, and nine billion people on the planet, as well as the rich biosphere and the ecosystems that uh, contain plants and animals, many of whom we've learned about, but a lot of whom are unknown to us, can flourish, can plan for their future, the humans at least, can live a dignified life. And we have to start thinking about those possible interventions now. Some of these are literally science fiction. Science fiction because they inherit the daring, inspiring images of the classic space operas. For example, shielding Earth from solar radiation so that the warming is reversed because less solar radiation arrives on, on Earth. This shielding can be achieved either spraying certain chemicals in the highest uh, levels of the atmosphere, um, simulating the effects of uh, supervolcano eruptions that in the past have achieved um, important and long duration cooling effects, or they can be space-based where um, basically solar sails would uh, be shading um, the appropriate parts for appropriate amounts of time of the planet. But we also have to make 
our cities and our civilization resilient. We have to make sure that uh, if we can learn something uh, from those parts of the world that already uh, are under uh, in increased levels of uh, uh, temperature, uh, where you need to be inside with air conditioning, well, we have to make uh, livable conditions available to everybody. And we, we have to realize that making modern tools of adaptation and adaptability available locally is the best way for the local populations, the local cities to find how to improve their conditions, how to improve their resilience. We have to use vertical farming, um, indoor uh, production of uh, plants, animal proteins. We have to radically decrease the cost of digging so that these three-dimensional structures that can produce a lot of uh, our food can be uh, built without impacting the areas that can then be returned to forests, even though not primary, but to those forests that can become carbon sinks. We have to understand how to generate drinkable water in very large quantities for those areas of the world that will have increasing problems of drinking water with entire river systems um, changing course or drying up with the diminishing of uh, the ice sheets and glaciers that are that are feeding them and the lack or the change of uh, rain patterns and monsoons. And we have to do this for obvious reasons, because our empathy and our understanding of what is going on requires it. But these are also incredible business opportunities to build trillion dollar companies that have the power of doing geoengineering with open eyes, of changing the planet for the better, and for keeping the trajectory of human civilization uh, towards improving and towards uh, creating rich opportunities for everybody. I am very uh, curious about uh, the reactions uh, on this video, which uh, is touching on a delicate and complex uh, subject. And uh, I welcome your comments, your feedback, your questions. Um, and I thank you for listening and watching uh, the context as always. Uh, you can become a supporter of the context on Patreon for as little as $5 a month. You will help me and my team creating these videos and to give a broader understanding of the challenges of our world today and to create the future together with you. Thanks.